episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, once again to another episode of our show, bringing you today another fascinating guest who's uh, helping and uh, has helped create a better tomorrow on so many different fronts uh, for all of us. Uh, today, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Paul Offit, uh, who is an internationally recognized expert uh, in the field of virology, of immunology, a co inventor of a landmark vaccine for the prevention of uh, rotavirus uh, gastroenteritis, and who holds uh, multiple titles, uh, including uh, Director of Vaccine. Education Center here at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, uh, the Maurice R. Heilman Chair of Vaccinology and Professor of Pediatrics at the Perlman School of Medicine at UPenn, uh, and Adjunct Associate Professor at the Winster Institute. Uh, Dr. Offit was a member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization, pra immunization Practices for CDC, uh, founding advisory board member of the Autism Science Foundation and the Foundation for Vaccine Research, uh, member of the Institute of Medicine and co-editor of uh, the foremost vaccine text, Vaccines, along with another local Philly luminary Stan Plotkin. Uh, Dr. Offit has been <laughs> the recipient of numerous awards and honors over the years, has published over 150 papers, uh, and has become a, a prolific author uh, in recent years. Uh, many books, including but not limited to um, Vaccinated, One Man's Quest to Defeat the World's Deadly Disillnesses, Overkill, The Cutter Incident, uh, Breaking the Antibiotic Habits, uh, and his most recent one, which we'll be talking a lot about today, You Bet Your Life, uh, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccination, The Long and risky history of medical innovation. A lot to talk about, uh, but Dr. Paul Offit, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show today. Thanks, my pleasure. Uh, it's great having you. You know, I, I'd love to start off just uh, briefly, if I could give you the floor for a couple of minutes, just to uh, introduce yourself a little further. And if you could take us a little on the early journey of how you got interested in, in medicine and pediatrics and infectious diseases, and also how you picked rotavirus to focus on uh, this 25 some odd years ago, I think that'd be a great way to start things off. Sure. Well, I, I think um, probably my draw to medicine was that I sort of had a series of events when I was five years of age that required hospitalization, um, one of which landed me in a essentially a polio ward. Um, it wasn't, I didn't have polio. I had um, a, a unfortunately uh, poorly performed repair of uh, my club foot on my right foot. And and so um, I ended up in a, in a ward with, with children who had polio for about six weeks. And, and I saw what it looked like. You know, I saw children in our lungs. I saw children in traction. Um, this was, it was the name of the hospital at the time was Kernan's Hospital for Crippled Children back in the day when you could use words like crippled and feeble minded mm -hmm. in the name of, of children's hospitals. And, um, you know, this was, there was one visiting hour a week on Sundays from two to three. My mother had a complication of pregnancy with my brother, so she couldn't come. My father was a salesman, was on the road all the time. So pretty much nobody came. And I just remember staring out that, that window next to my bed, looking at the, uh, the front door, waiting for somebody to come save me. But what I, I saw was just how vulnerable and alone and isolated those children were. And I think that that image, that image just stuck with me. I think the scars of your childhood invariably become the passions of your adulthood. So I think that's why um, I chose um, medicine. I think it's why I chose pediatrics. In many ways, I think it's why I chose to write a book about the Cutter incident, which was a polio vaccine gone bad back in the 1950s. I think all of that was just the drama of my childhood. Um, but in terms of, of you know, I, I chose infectious diseases because I was, as is true of all the sort of arbitrary and capricious decisions that you make when you're uh, young, is was based on the people I met. I mean, mm -hmm. people like Ellen Wald, Ted Woodward, Stan Plock, I mean, were all just uh, luminaries that sort of attracted me to what they were doing. And um, in terms of rotavirus, I, I, I saw a child die of rotavirus when I was a resident at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, so that always stuck with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I got to Children's Hospital Philadelphia, there was a program trying to understand to study rotaviruses, ultimately with the goal of hopefully making a vaccine. And, and so I became part of that program, which was a 26 year effort before we finally had a vaccine that was clearly safe and effective. Outstanding. Outstanding. And, and you know, you, you know, you in your recent book, uh, You Bet Your Life, you take uh, the reader on this encyclopedic history of, of the development of life-saving medi medical breakthroughs, the people that develop them, and, and unfortunately, many of the risks and tragedies along the way. Uh, you go back as far as uh, the, the mid-1800s with the, the first sort of chloroform anesthetic deaths. Uh, you, you come to current day, the, the Jesse uh, Gelsinger case down the street here at Penn. Um, 
talk a little bit about why you chose to write this book. Was it, was it mainly focused on what we've seen the last couple of years in terms of vaccine hesitancy, or has this theme of, of breakthrough slash risk been something that you've been thinking about for a longer period of time? I think I think the purpose of the book was to try and get people to have a, an understanding of medical innovations that that it invariably involves a human price um, that we learn as we go. Uh, the The original title of the book was the learning curve, and I think people would think, you know what, let me wait till the learning curve is over and then I'll do it. But the learning curve is never over. Uh, you know, we look at this vaccine. Um, you know, we had I think within eleven months we're able to make uh, uh, within eleven months of isolating this virus, SARS CoV two, we were able to make two vaccines, um, both mRNA vaccines, it's a novel technology and, it, and the vaccines clearly worked well and, and certainly are safe, but they're not absolutely safe. And what you found out was something you would have never anticipated, which is that these vaccines are a very rare cause of myocarditis, you know, inflammation of the heart muscle. And for the young, for, for a boy or a young man, um, after the second dose, the, the instance, say, in the 16 to 17 year old is as high as one in 5,000. Now, it, it, the, the good news is, if there's ever good news about myocarditis, is it's generally short-lived, transient, and self-resolving. So it's not like the myocarditis caused by, say, a virus, which can be quite severe and occasionally result in a heart transplant. Um, that's not this, but it, it's still you know worrisome. And I think we're going to find out that there's a spectrum of illness. But, but that was the point. I mean, because people see that and they think, see, that's why you can't trust the system. But um, there is a that you learn as you go, and and that's always true. And every every time we have a new technology, people seem to get disappointed that you know they that they would think that that we're so far advanced in medicine or science that we don't have a learning curve. But you know the history of drug regulation, is, as Michael Harris, a historian, said famously, is built on tombstones, and that's what I go through. I go through the nine major medical advances: antibiotics, vaccines, uh, chemotherapy, anesthesia. Um, and and others and to those those advances have allowed us to live thirty years longer than we did a hundred years ago. But it always comes with a price. Always, even even the even with the successes come with a price. I mean, so for for example, if you look at um, if you look at the, the polio, the polio story is a perfect story. I mean, the the, the um, when Jonas Salk made his polio vaccine um, and it was launched, the one company made it badly. Cutter Laboratories made it badly. So instead of taking what they should have done, which is to have fully inactivated the polio virus in that vaccine, they failed to do that. And as a consequence, 120,000 children were inoculated with live, fully virulent polio virus. Um, about uh, 40,000 developed short-lived polio, aborted polio, 164 children were permanently killed and, and, and 10, I'm sorry, were, 164 children were permanently paralyzed and 10 were killed. I think it was the worst biological disaster in this country's history and gave birth to vaccine regulation in the US. It was the birth of the division of biologic standards. But, but and so that was the failure. That was a failure that ultimately led to better mass production. But even mm -hmm. the successes come with a price. And, and that's the point I wanted to make. Because again, I get back to the polio story because I guess it's so uh, so central to me as a child of the 50s. Um, yep. But you know, when Jonas Salk did his, when Jonas Salk made his vaccine, he tested it in 700 children in the Pittsburgh area, found that it was safe and effective, or found that it was safe and that, that it induced an immune response that he thought would be therefore make it effective. Um, and he said to his wife that night, Donna, I think I've got it. Eureka, got it. Didn't want to do anything more than that. But, you know, nonetheless, there was a trial. So 420,000 children got his vaccine, 200,000 got placebo. That broke his heart. He didn't want to do that trial. He didn't want to give placebo vaccine to children in the, 19, uh, in the 1950s, knowing that polio was going to happen every summer. And so, and so the vaccine was declared safe, potent, and effective. And that, that headline was on the, 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 every newspaper in this country, right? Church bells rang out, synagogues held special prayer meetings. There were, um, you know, the department stores stopped while that announcement was made. It was announced over Voice of America to Europe. It was safe, potent, and effective. So how do we know it was effective? We knew it was effective because 16 children died from polio in that study, all in the placebo group. We knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study, 34 in the placebo placebo group. I mean, those were first and second graders in the 1950s. I was a first and second grader in the 1950s. I mean, but for the flip of a coin, those children could have lived long, fulfilling lives. And, and that's the price for success also. I, so that wasn't considered a tragedy, but you could argue it was. And, and we, we're watching the, the vaccines now on Tuesday, tomorrow, I am going to sit with the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee and determine whether or not we want to approve the vaccine for the five to 11 years old. And that'll be based on a, a few thousand children that were studied by Pfizer. And we are then going to make decisions for millions of children based mm -hmm. on those data. And those stories are always in your head. You know, 
the, the, the Gutter incident is a fascinating one. The, the, another, you know, you know, obviously really critical one in sort of the history of, of drug development is uh, one that you talk about, elixir sulfanilamide. You know, we have this uh, major poisoning event in 1937, leads to the death of uh, over 100 people. The next year, 1938, we get the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Uh, about a couple decades later, with, with the thalidomide tragedy, we get the Kefauver Harris amendments, um, and we have a structure for you know discipline, safety, and efficacy studying of drugs. Yet, you know, as you point out, uh, we can't wait to know everything. We're never going to know everything, and and you know, uh, even in today's world, you know, uh, drug studies are you know we include certain populations, we exclude others, uh, we have a, an average understanding of things like pharmacogenetics, toxicogenetics. And then when it comes to mechanisms of action, you know, repurposing is a really hot topic nowadays. We learn that, you know, our cholesterol lowering drugs uh, 40 years later do X, Y, and Z also. Uh, talk a little bit more, because I think a lot of people think, you know, with all these wonderful FDA laws, we have 100%, well, we don't, but it's never gonna be that case. Talk a little bit more about this. We're never gonna know everything about drugs. Right, and we and we put in place regulations to try and make sure that these these tragic events never happen again, and they always happen because they have to happen. Because as you push forward into the realm of new science and, and new technologies, you're going to learn as you go. I think you know, Penn is the perfect example with the Jesse Gelsinger story. I mean, yep. you have um, Jesse Gelsinger was a 19 year old man who lacked an enzyme, liver enzyme called ornithine transcarbamylase, which helps him basically convert food into energy. And, and so as a consequence of that, he had to take, have a restricted diet. He had to take 30 pills every day, which for a 19 year old was hard. So he was willing to volunteer for a trial, run at Penn uh, by Jim Wilson, um, to, to get essentially a, a, uh, a adenovirus, which is a common cold virus that was replication defective, meaning it, it couldn't reproduce itself, into which was cloned then the gene that he lacked. It's actually very similar to the adenovirus vectors that are used today in the Johnson Johnson vaccine or the AstraZeneca vaccine. So he was inoculated with large quantities of this virus particle. And, and even though there had been many people studied before him and, in a, and a woman who had received the same amount a virus that he had sort of next to him in many ways, he was overwhelmed and had essentially a, a response that looked like bacterial sepsis. It looked like invasive bacterial disease, which is to say his immune system overreacted, producing a particular protein called interleukin-6 that, that killed him. I mean, and so he died. He died of an experimental gene therapy. And there was, there was that, that set gene therapy back years. And, you know, the federal government put in place um, gene therapy restrictions to try and prevent that kind of tragedy from ever happening again. But there is no preventing that. I mean, you, you have to be willing to continue to push forward. I mean, the, the notion of the precautionary principle, which is exercise caution uh, to avoid harm, but when you, when you slow things down, harm is, is occurring anyway, because there are a lot of people out there with single gene diseases who could benefit from gene therapy. So um, as we learned from that particular episode, um, now when you have also at Penn, you know, the so-called CAR T therapy, where you take people's T cells, engineer them to basically kill cancer cells. Um, that initial response actually happened in a, a girl named Emily Whitehead. She too acted just like Jesse Gelsinger. She too looked like she had invasive bacterial disease, but now you knew why. You knew what had happened to Jesse Gelsinger. You knew why it had happened to Jesse Gelsinger. You had in hand the kind of biologicals like monoclonal antibodies directed against that interleukin six that could save her life. And that now has become in many ways standard therapy for pa patients who get the so-called CAR T therapy to treat their cancers. And so she's a hero. I mean, mm -hmm. Emily White has, has a hero. You don't hear much about Jesse Gelsinger because we obviously celebrate our successes, but not our recognize our failures. But Jesse Gelsinger was a hero too. He, he taught us a lot on... Um, I just think that, um, again, uh, as I say, the history of, of <laughs> not only drug regulation, but drug advances or medical advances is invariably built on tombstones. And I just, I just think people need to understand that. They need yep. to understand the process or else they're just going to continually be disappointed by it. Oh, and just one other thing. I think sure. and so you put in place all these things. You put in place all these regulations. And then French researchers use a retrovirus to introduce a gene into children who lack this one gene. Um, as it turns out, of the 10 people, children, that they originally uh, gave this retrovirus to, because the advantage of a retrovirus is it inserts itself directly into your DNA, yep. um, is it happened to just insert right in front of a gene that increased your risk for leukemia. And four of those 10 children got leukemia, at least one of whom has already died. 
And so now we know to put an insula so-called insulator gene there that now prevents that from happening. And so now you have a much better gene therapy tool. And, you know, people would say, you know, I just think we shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't do those kinds of experiments. And people mm -hmm. always sort of use the word experimental as equi being equivalent to dangerous, but it has to happen. It's, these kind of things have to happen. Um, here, I mean, the J&J &J vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccines are very rare causes of blood clots, including serious blood clots. Mm -hmm. I mean, it occurs in maybe one in 500,000 people. So it's extraordinarily rare. You probably are at greater risk of, of, uh, of, of having a problem while driving to the office to get your vaccine than from that vaccine itself. But um, nonetheless, we learn as we go. And yep. there is there just at some level has to be an appreciation for that. Yeah. Um, you know, Paul, you are a scientist, you're a clinician, but you're also an innovator. You spent, you know, decades with the rotavirus, developing the rotavirus uh, vaccine. And, and as you know, you just pointed out, uh, you know, we've gone from an era of, of sort of original vaccines, small molecules, and so forth. We're in this era now of, of uh, messenger RNA vaccines, CAR T cells, monoclonal antibodies, and a bunch of new stuff is coming. Uh, we don't know what it is yet. Uh, bacteriophages, we talked about on the show, and digital therapeutics and electroceuticals, um, a lot of new stuff. How is a, you're an innovator. <laughs> How do we balance, uh, what, what are your thoughts on balancing, looking out 2022 into the future? How do we balance innovation <laughs> with this uh, fear factor? Uh, what, how do you, what do you think of these things as you uh, approach this from, from these different angles? Um, you push forward, well, this is just one quick aside. Um, in There's a book by Sinclair Lewis called Aerosmith about okay. the then which I read when I was in high school and it's uh, it's about the this sort of fictional man named Martin Arrowsmith who who goes to South America and basically ends a a a plague pandemic you know caused by bacteria by using bacteriophage you know so, so which is to say bacteriophage are bacteria that enter viruses and um, va or, or sorry bacteriophage are viruses that enter bacteria and kill bacteria so phage means eat so these are sort of like bacteria eating viruses. Mm -hmm. but th this book was written in 1920. I mean, yep. this was before sulfonilamide. This was before antibiotics. This, yep. this is what we used to do. Now, yep. because we've taken our first steps into the post-antibiotic era, where there are children, certainly at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who have bacteria that are resistant to all antibiotics. And so we're using bacteriophage again. It's interesting that we call that new. I mean, it is certainly new. We haven't used it for a while, but we used it 100 years ago because it's all we had. That's so how I brought it up. <laughs> back to the future. It's just... Uh, sort of an amazing story. But, you know, it's, it's, you just saw in the last few days, there was a, a man who successfully received a kidney from a pig. It was a pig kidney, which the pig had been genetically engineered so that essentially it wouldn't express the kind of proteins on the cell surface that would cause that, that pig kidney to be rejected. By, his, by that person's immune system. So we, we're now starting to take our first steps into that. So how do you balance that? If this, which is your question, there are, for example, 4,000 people now waiting for a heart transplant. 1,300 of them will die while waiting. Yep. They will. You don't know which 1,300 it's going to be, but 1,300 will die. So do you want to take the chance then? Do you want to take the chance to be that person, one of the first people to receive, say, a pig heart? I mean, we have some experience with pig valves, so it's not completely novel uh, that are in people, but... But that's it if you have sickle cell disease, you know, do you want to be, or, or cystic fibrosis, do you want to be one of the first people to try so-called CRISPR, um, which is a gene editing system? So you can take, for example, someone with sickle cell disease who suffer often many hospitalizations every year for these so-called vaso-occlusive crises, meaning uh, painful crises when those, those red blood cells sickle because they have an abnormal hemoglobin in them. They get stuck in capillaries and it's incredibly painful. And so many, certainly the older sickle cell patients are opioid addicts because of that. And so, so you could uh, enter into a CRISPR technology uh, pro protocol where you'll have your bone marrow cells removed. CRISPR will then edit your, the genes of those bone marrow cells. So now at least a, a certain percentage of them will make normal hemoglobin, put it back into you and, and, and see what happens. Now, people who have sickle cell disease live 40 years, 40 plus years, but they definitely have a shortened lifespan. Um, so, so you could say, okay, I want to be one of those people, knowing that you may take what was a 40 year lifespan and make it shorter or make it longer. Um, you don't know that the, for the people are doing this now. There was a woman has, who's just lived two years post uh, having that sort of CRISPR technology edit her cell. So it's just, um, it's a, it's a push and pull. It, it's, it's, you know, you, 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 um, there's an analogy that was made by Christian Barnard, who is a, um, 
who was the first person to do a human heart transplant, human to human heart transplant. He did it in the late 60s in South Africa. He was at a time probably the most famous physician in the world, even though that heart transplant patient lived 18 days. Um, but his, his analogy was, you know, that you're you're not going to jump into into a river and try and swim across to, to a, say, safe land um, if you know that there's alligators in the river. However, if there's a lion chasing you, you will. And I, that's how he saw that first heart transplant patient who wasn't going to live much longer without one. Well, coming coming back to the the Cutter incident, which you know you uh, you laid out early in the discussion, you know here we are. It's it's seventy years later. I mean that was a uh, a real problem, uh, and we learned from it, and we've improved over the last seventy years. Um, you have been at the epicenter of some. I'll, I'll just say I don't know less real problems in terms of the whole autism debate and vaccines, and then we are in an era of crazy problems. Uh, no, Bill Gates is not microchipping me um, and so forth. Uh, as a vaccine luminary, um, how have we gotten to this point <laughs> in 2022? Um, you know, over the last 70 years where we've gone from what was a real issue to these unreal real issues. Um, I think that it's a combination of many things. I think on the in, vaccines are in many ways a victim of their own success. Um, yeah. The people don't see vaccine preventable diseases anymore. I mean, when Jenny McCarthy, for example, goes on the Oprah Winfrey show and says, uh, because she believes that her son uh, got autism from receiving a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And she says, you know, I'll take the frickin' measles every time, meaning it's distinct from getting a measles vaccine. I would rather get measles, which tells you that that um, she doesn't know how sick measles can make you. I mean, right. measles would cause 48,000 children to be hospitalized every year, it would kill 500 children in the United States every year. Um, when measles comes into our hospital, which now with the Afghanistan um, refugees is happening, um, yeah. they ask people like me, old people like me to come take a look because I can tell whether somebody has measles in 30 seconds. And the way I can tell is whether they're sick. I mean, you know, red eyes, so-called conjunctivitis, cough, runny nose, and but look sick. And that's someone with measles. Um, so I think we've not only eliminated sort of measles largely from this country, we've eliminated the memory of measles. And I, I, think, I think that's part of it. I think we're a much more cynical, litigious, uh, distrusting society. I see it as a kind of post-Watergate thing. I think that was, to me, the death of innocence in this country was when you looked behind the curtain and you saw those Nixon tapes and you, you we, what you read in those tapes was something, you, at least for me, I just hadn't imagined could, could happen, that that could be such a, a um, dishonest war basically was the way I was, because I'm, I was, I'm of an age where I, I could have been drafted, I, but well, I was the second year of the draft lottery. Everybody who was part of that draft lottery still remembers their number. I was 265, so therefore I wasn't going to have to fight in Vietnam, but, you know, but, but for the, the a ping pong ball. So, so I think that's it. And also, I think we're always trying to create order out of chaos. And I think that, that, that here, so a, a pandemic is chaos. I think with, with sort of like these, this, this movie's like Plandemic, you know, which was would briefly out there until people got had the sense to take it off of these social media sites. I mean, what that did, it's created order out of chaos. Bill Gates is the problem. You know, Bill Gates has created this, or, or the lab in Wuhan has created this. And, and here are these evil forces working behind the curtain who are creating all of this. That creates a certain order. It's dishonest. It's not true. But at least it gives you something to hold on to, I, I think, is, is part of it. So I think... And then the internet, uh, you know, the internet allows you, even though you may be a, a, an unusual person in terms of your beliefs, you can very quickly find other people who share those unusual and invariably wrong beliefs very quickly on the internet. I appreciate that. I, I appreciate your perspective on that, on this one, because this is quite critical on today, uh, what's going on. Um, Paul, one more, um, but the most serious question, um, I'm facetious here, but I, so I have three kids, they're, they're teenagers now, but nothing used to raise my blood pressure more uh, than when one of them would come home from school and tell me the story about how one of their classmates threw up, because I knew that they're bringing home that stomach virus and it's going to circle through our family and cause all sorts of problems. Uh, where are we with regard to uh, norovirus vaccines or just general stomach gastroenteritis? getting rid of the stomach viruses from <laughs> from this world. I, I think there's, so rotavirus was at least the most common cause of uh, gastroenteritis in the world sure. um, with the availability of, of not only our vaccine, but also the Rotorix vaccine developed at Children's Hospital in Cincinnati and, and yeah. uh, is also out there in the world. Um, we've largely reduced that. Certainly we've, we've almost eliminated the disease from the United States. A norovirus, I think, is not that far away. 
Uh, but, but one other thing, just to sort of finish, finish up, because I didn't finish it before, in terms sure. of creating order out of chaos, I think what what what, um, what the, the vaccine autism notion does is the same thing. It provides order out of chaos because because we don't really have a clear sense of the cause or causes of autism. We certainly don't have a sense of any treatment for autism. What, what this did was it pro provided order. Evil pharmaceutical companies made a vaccine. They knew it caused autism. Nonetheless, they're putting it out on us. And all those studies that show that the vaccine doesn't cause autism are wrong, and they're all influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. If you want to avoid autism, just don't get the vaccine or separate it into its three component parts, which for the most part is not possible. And if you also want to get rid of the toxins associated with, with getting uh, vaccines, here's a way to get to, to rid your child of autism. So, so it provides uh, an order out of chaos. It's a sort of a cottage industry of false hope. There are a mm -hmm. lot of people who cash in on that. It's unconscionable, but I think it's the same story in many ways, this kind of, um, they, they, now you have some control uh, over what is, uh, for in the case of autism, an emotionally and financially burdensome um, problem. What, uh, you, you mentioned um, the FDA meeting coming up or the advisory panel, um, anything else, uh, obviously nothing confidential, but other things you're going to be doing in the coming months, Paul, conferences you're going to be talking at, the lectures, things that we can continue to follow you and, and, and all your successes in the space. I mean, well, so as far as the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee meeting, we will no doubt be meeting and possibly before the end of the year to talk about vaccines for the six-month-old to five-year-old. I think those data are also being generated and will be presented to us. I think Novavax also have, has a vaccine. Mm -hmm which is a purified protein vaccine that's adjuvanted, so sort of similar to like the hepatitis B vaccine or the human papillomavirus vaccine, that may yep. also come to our attention. And I think, you know, this virus is gonna be with us for a while, although hopefully we'll we'll get on top at least of the pandemic nature of this um, we, and we'll bring it down to sort of an e endemic level where we're just dealing with it as much the same way we deal with a lot of winter respiratory viruses. This virus is gonna be with us for a while. And I think as long as it exists in the world, we're gonna to need to have a highly vaccinated population. So I think all these new vaccines that are gonna come come in and you're going to see them um, will, will be different, different in their dur durability of protection, different in their ability to cover variants as new variants arise, different in their um, in their safety profiles. And there may be horses for courses, as they say, where there's <laughs> one group that may be better receiving a vaccine than another. So I think this is going to be, we're going to be dealing with this for years. Got it. Well, I, Paul, I appreciate uh, the time you've taken to come on the show and talk to us about these critical issues. Um, I, I think everybody, you know, should should go out, uh, check out the book, You Bet Your Life, From Blood Transfusions to Mass Vaccination, A Long and Risky History of Medical Innovation, uh, available at Amazon and other sources. Uh, for everybody that's going to be listening to this particular episode uh, on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel, you've been listening to Dr. Paul Offit, Director of the Vaccine. Vaccine Education Center, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Maurice Heilman Chair of Vaccinology and Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania and Associate Professor at Worcester Institute of Anatomy and Biology. Uh, Paul, I want to thank you again for taking the time out of your schedule to do this. Thanks for everything that you're doing and have been doing over your career. And as we say on our show, thanks for helping to create that better tomorrow for all of us. A very, very inspirational story. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Good luck. <laughs>